Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue these series of videos on Fichte and German idealism by moving on today to the first lecture on his The Science of Knowledge. And this video will cover roughly the first 50% of material um, and uh, largely dealing with his take on the theoretical. In the next video, we move on to his take on the practical. Now, you might have noticed it's been about a year since I've done anything with Fichte. It's about Christmas time of 2019, and I've also been averaging about one video per year on the topic. Um, I had one in 2018, one in 2019, and I did manage to get one before the end of 2020, but I do hope to deal with him much more frequently than that in the future. And uh, what better way to um, continue the discussion now than to deal with one of the most underappreciated works of philosophy? It's actually quite rare to find um, a treatment of the step-by-step -step arguments within the science of knowledge, but they're uh, quite fascinating. So I think the best way to begin is by contrasting Fichte uh, with his greatest influence. I think the best way to understand how Kant and Fichte relate is that whereas Kant gave you the critique of pure reason, Fichte tries to give you the system of pure reason. For example, Fichte found Kant's treatment of the thing in itself to be totally unsatisfactory because he basically just tells you that it's the excess which lies outside of the mind. The only thing we can say about it is that it's whatever is left over after you've considered all of the things which do fit neatly within phenomenal experience. For this reason, Kant did not actually provide a properly systematic account of the thing in itself, but rather just took its presence for granted. He saw it as a given with no need for any further explanation. For this reason, Fichte warned that even ascribing the positive name nomina to this is inherently misleading, for Kant gives us a purely negative construct. This is defined only as that on which the categories do not have any applicability. In addition, Fichte argued that Kant largely accepted the table of judgments as a sufficient foundation to derive the categories from, that is to say, Kant um, gave us the pure concepts like substance, cause and effect, etc., simply by deducing them from what were the valid forms of argumentation, the valid um, ways of, of forming uh, judgments within logic. He simply deduces what the pure concepts are from those, and yet Fichte found this unsatisfactory because that's actually smuggling an a posteriori element into what is supposed to be a pure system not contaminated by any empirical or concrete data. Fichte, on the other hand, sought to deduce the categories from a single common principle which had to have a properly a priori status. For this reason, Fichte sought to provide the system of pure reason where Kant had only provided critique. Likewise, Kant's error was to fail to actually give us a unified system, because the thing in itself is simply left on the outside of it. The categories and valid forms of thought, in addition, are not deduced from an a priori principle with a clear place within the broader system. And finally, the account of morality requires one to postulate certain supernatural elements which explicitly cannot be proven systematically, but can only be accepted on faith. This lack of unity in Kant's philosophy becomes even clearer when one tries to incorporate both theoretical and moral world into a single system. You find that each might appear, but only as a separate world which might be viewed one at a time as though the other did not exist at that moment, while simultaneously requiring the existence of both in order for Kant's uh, philosophy as a whole to make sense. Whereas Kant tried to get out of this mess by simply attributing different subjective faculties to the governing of each, that is to say, understanding how handles the theoretical, and reason handles the practical, this really is not good enough for Fichte because it implies that some common principle, which is neither understanding nor reason as such, but rather that which makes the passage from one to the other possible, exists. Whether Kant realized it or not, even he himself posited these as the three absolutes of his own philosophy, even though he only covered two of them. Fichte's journey is therefore simply to find this mysterious third absolute from which one could deduce both theoretical and practical reason. Fichte noted that if one did find this principle, one could satisfy the conditions of both deducing an entire unified system from it and doing so purely, that is to say, on strictly a priori grounds, uncontaminated by a posteriori contingencies.
Likewise, Fichte admits that speculative philosophy cannot um, be satisfied with constructing two classes of objects. On the one hand, you have the irrational or the chaotic um, excess which defies any explanation but still exists by chance, and on the other hand, the concrete or that which lacks the purity of any truly systematic construct but can still be accounted for through totally empirical and a posteriori methods. Whereas the naive viewer might only allow mathematics to satisfy the conditions of being both totally rational and totally pure. Fichte argued that philosophy can do this too, but actually at a far more general and complete level. This is because it can account for all that is instead of only accounting for numbers, geometrical constructs, etc. as mathematics would. Likewise, Fichte is not simply interested in laying out the valid epistemological forms of thought with indifference to the ultimate metaphysical question of what really is. For a truly serious inquiry into the former will have to answer the latter. Yet even a system accounting for all being must still have just one principle, for if there were not a single principle, you would have um, infinite regression or a chaotic splintering of several distinct systems rather than a single unified one. How on earth, though, can we find this except by doing something similar to Kant? Like descending below our own thoughts to uncover a certain purified foundation which is already there in the background. In this search for the Holy Grail, Fichte begins by taking the most abstract and formal proposition he could possibly imagine, which is of course A is A or A equals A. This would seem to satisfy the criteria because we cannot actually reduce it to any simpler syntactic constructs, nor is it dependent upon its subject matter since anything whatsoever could be substituted for the placeholder A and the statement would still be true. Contrary to expectation, even the statement a is, although seemingly more simple, is actually less pure because it still depends upon the material and empirical existence of whatever A might happen to be. In that statement, you really are affirming that something exists, whether that be space, time, my ego, God, or whatever, whereas the formal identity A equals A has no such constraint. This is somewhat deceptive, however. Because A equals A is not a statement affirming absolute identity between subject and predicate, but rather, paradoxically, depends upon a certain gap of difference between the two in order to make sense as really meaningful rather than be an empty, redundant tautology akin to the seemingly simpler statement A is, which is ironically more difficult to prove. The real point of A equals A is therefore just its own dependence upon the existence of a certain grounding between subject and predicate, which we might call X. X is therefore more originary than either. Where, though, can we find X, except in the judging act of the subject himself or herself? The subject is the one who grounds the grounding by establishing the principle more originary even than A equals A by its own subjective act. This subjective act is, of course, just the act of positing. Now, anyone who has read Fichte will surely have encountered that word so many times as to border on the absurd, but its ambiguity is largely just the result of an imperfect translatability. What Fichte really meant was to find or recognize, and thus to assume is given, rather than the more active notion of a spontaneous creation out of nothing, which you might think he is talking about. X as the grounding of A equals A is therefore absolutely posited in the I itself. Likewise, this subjective affirmation, I equals I, is not simply a repetition of the empty identity A equals A, with the subject substituted for the variable position, as you might think. Instead, the affirmation of the subject really is different. This is a permanent affirmation, whereas the empty formula A equals A is true only conditionally. Whereas it's only the form of A equals A which is certain, it is precisely the content of I equals I which is certain. This is the absoluteness of the subject, and hence a brand of German idealism far more radical than anything you find within Kant's system. However, even establishing I equals I will not be good enough if this is treated as a mere empirical fact of being. It must somehow be realized as a properly practical act, or rather as an activity.
in itself. By this fixture did not mean, however, the David Humean claim that there is no I as such, there's only a stream of ideas. Fichte maintains a certain enduring identity of the I, while still emphasizing its ontological character as an activity, and he does this in order to avoid the error of dogmatism, which would make subjective freedom impossible. Because I equals I cannot be deduced from the empty identity A equals A, because the latter actually depends upon some pre given existence of a subject. What I equals I really means is just that the subject must paradoxically posit itself. This self-positing is, by the way, the pure, absolute activity of the subject because the subject is somehow the product of its own action. In contrast, a brute object like a stone is not for itself in Hegel's terms, precisely because it lacks this power to posit itself in Fichte's terms. And for this reason, it lacks the power of self-consciousness, which actually provides a better definition of being than mere physical objectivity would, an insight which uh, Husserl would have in a 20th century phenomenology, but you already find it there in Fichte and German idealism. This is because the self-positing is totally unconditional. It is an act of absolute freedom. This is why the subject cannot be understood as just another thing, for this would miss the entire point of the miracle that the self can only be through positing itself. Being qua being is for Fichte really just this self-positing, which is why only the self-positing self truly is. For this reason, it's inherently misleading even to call this self subject, for it's always subject, object, or positor and posited at once. Because we have already established the proposition A equals A, any proposition of the form B equals B or C equals C would not be anything new, but would only substitute some other variable for the position of A. To generate a genuinely new proposition for the system, we therefore need contradiction, and we find this with the second proposition, not A is not A. The affirmation of not A will be as absolutely affirmed as the first proposition, yet the content, that is to say, the not A, will be somehow dependent upon the A. Still, both A and not A must be found within the same realm of consciousness. In fact, this requirement rules out in advance the naive view that the not I is just any exterior object whatsoever. Fichte asserts, rather, that the only way you could reach a notion of the not-I is by the subject's own exclusion of the not-I from itself. Only an absolute negation by the I could be correlated with the absolute affirmation found earlier. In other words, the I posits both itself and it posits the not-I as well. Is it, however, a contradiction to say that the I only exists through positing itself, but that it also posits the not I? Well, not if it's only a partial contradiction, kind of like the Sparknotes view of Hegel and Half-Truths, or maybe the end Avengers Endgame portrayal of the Hulk, in which, well, it seems like a strict opposition between the rational scientist who plays the role of Dr. Jekyll and the animal within who plays the role of Mr. Hyde, but you actually can find a way to have the best of both worlds. You can have a Hulk who is as um, intelligent as Bruce Banner, but as strong as the big green guy. You just have to be a little creative. In Fichte's system as well, um, the two do not cancel each other out, but rather limit one another. The not I is the limit, really, which limits the I, and the I is the limit which limits the not I. In fact, we find that this limitation is necessary to obtain any definition whatsoever, for the absolute I is actually empty and is incapable of taking on any concrete predicates. Kind of like Hegel's view that totally pure being only becomes nothing when you examine it further. Only through the seemingly negative process of limitation, therefore, does anything like a definite something emerge. Fichte has therefore successfully deduced three categories of reality, negation, and limitation with these three fundamental propositions. These are, in review, the I posits itself, 
the I posits the not I, and a divisible not I is posited over against a divisible I. We must be careful, however, to understand that when Fichte opposes this limited I with the infinite, or more precisely, the unlimited I, he does not mean that the only experiences in which limitation plays any role are negative ones in which we literally feel an obstacle obstructing our path. It is rather all states of consciousness which imply limitation, because limitation is required to have determinacy. Fichte to held that although contradiction is unearthed at the analytic level, resolution is achieved at the synthetic level. For this, we should quickly review Kant's distinction. Given a set of affirmative judgments with a subject-predicate relation, predicate B might belong to subject A or it might lie outside of it. For example, an analytic judgment merely elucidates what is already contained in the subject without adding any new information. A statement like all bodies are extended merely elucidates what a body already is without expanding that definition as such. Basically, analytic judgments are valid just because they do not violate the principle of contradiction. In synthetic judgments, on the other hand, you do expand because there is new information in the predicate which cannot be derived simply from an analysis of the subject itself. An empirical judgment is inherently synthetic, for example, because all bodies are heavy, um, gives you extra information which cannot be derived simply from um, elucidating the meaning of the subject itself. The two somehow belong together without being contained in one another. It's not so controversial to speak of empirical synthetic a priori judgments like Cheyenne is in Wyoming, but how on earth could such a synthesis be possible without any empirical data inputted from intuition, in which case it would be synthetic but also a priori. Now, we actually deal with such statements all the time. In fact, even very basic arithmetical truths like 7 plus 5 equals 12 are such statements because there's no way to arrive at the number 12 just from an analysis of the numbers 7 and 5. There is indeed new information there, but not derived from experience qua sensation, and therefore still requires a type of purified intuition which Kant explains through the um, purified uh, uh, element of time. Geometrical truths, like a straight line is the shortest distance between two points, are also synthetic a priori for just the same reason. They require a purified intuition of space to demonstrate the truth rather than merely speak the concept linguistically. Ironically, the idea that the movement of the system will proceed by means of just such an antithesis and synthesis is almost always attributed to Hegel, but this is actually Fichte's idea. Fichte was the one who held that the analytic contradiction might be resolved by synthesis. But even if that were the case, he tells us, they are, however, only partially united. Extremes still remain that are not brought together. The process continues as far as it can be carried, because a fundamental contradiction at last will remain unsolved. This endpoint where no further synthesis is possible is, of course, just the endpoint of the absolute I as opposed to the limited or determinate I. Absolute freedom has no comparison with any lower entity, not even the life force of animals, which is determined by instinct and habitat. Because absolute freedom is the endpoint which must be posited more as a systematic goal which one seeks to achieve than anything else. In fact, making the contradictions in the fundamental propositions explicit really is a productive method for deducing even more categories of thought in a properly systematic movement. This is quite similar to Hegel's view that negation is good because it moves the dialectical process forward. For example, the third proposition, the I posits the me as limited by the not me, can yield um, two more categories, that of causality, or the not me determines the me, and the category of substantiality, which is the I determines itself. Likewise, you might have noticed that we are now progressively deducing the categories of Kant himself, but we're doing it in a systematic way. And, by the way, from a common principle. Rather than just assume the whole table at once by deriving it from another table of judgments as Kant had done in the Critique of Pure Reason. In addition, the categorical heading of relation assumed by Kant as a sort of generic um, a bundle of three other categories is something which Fichte found he actually could deduce from the mutual limitation of the me and the not me. 
However, the general term relation can only be made more determinate through resolving the contradiction by means of another synthesis. If we consider this relation more closely, we will find that the not me is posited negatively, but not in a totally abstract negation. Instead, we assume the not me to be a certain quantum, and therefore a negative quantity, which is also assumed to be a reality, that is to say, a contradiction of reality's assumed status of total positivity uh, belonging to the me. Yet what is this reality which even the not me has except the reality of the I's act of positing itself? Just as Hegel would say that what is rational is actual and vice versa, Fichte concluded that instead of being an inert substance of the dogmatic thing in itself, the meaning of reality simply is this activity, and activity is reality. The word for the negative activity of the I, which sustains the reality of the not-me, is simply the activity of passivity, or affect. Likewise, the I is both active and passive at once, because it both determines and is determined. This is, of course, another contradiction which we have on Earth, but the resolution is just to realize that the I determines its activity through its passivity and determines its passivity through its activity. We find also that whereas passivity is activity, but of a lower grade, even active thinking is just a lower grade of activity in comparison with the full activity of the absolute I. Likewise, it is not only passivity, but actually all activity, which entails the contradiction of being both positive and negative at once. With the category of substantiality established, we realize that activities which are limited in this way are accidents in relation to the substance of the full I. Limitation, therefore, is always accidental. What is the source of this limitation, though, except precisely the not-me itself? The contradiction between the limited me and the infinite I of pure activity remains, therefore, and the goal is just to find another resolution on a synthetic level to overcome it. Above all, the riddle is how the not-me could limit me if activity is defined as the positing activity of the I. The category of causality would certainly lead one to attribute reality to the not-me because it limits me, while the category of substantiality would lead one to assume that only the I exists because the not-me is itself just the result of the I's positing. The great antinomy of Fichte's system is therefore that only one of these would seem to exist. It's either the me or the not me, and yet it really does seem to be both at once. Assuming the existence of only one but not the other would, however, make it impossible to assume the activity of positing as such, because the me's activity presupposes the passivity of the not me, and vice versa. There must instead be some common element upon which both of them depend, which is simply activity as such. But we can actually be more specific than that. This is the activity of imagination. This is because the difference between passivity and activity in the me and not me is, me is not merely quantitative, as we had before thought. It is also qualitative. Just as Kant argued that mere sensations alone are not enough to account for the phenomenal experience of reality because only the imagination can provide the proper schematization for a world to appear as such, Fichte held that qualitative differences inherent in relations can only be established with imagination. The me and not me are both revealed to be creations of imagination rather than absolute givens. Because the imagination is free even though its products are determined, we have somehow satisfied both criteria at once in another miraculous synthesis of contraries. Because me and not me are somehow both mutually exclusive and dependent upon one another, we need the concept of a limit or boundary to explain how they can still relate. A boundary is a peculiar thing because the question to which does it belong defies ordinary notions of belonging. If the limit belonged to only one side, it would be just another ordinary property of that thing, rather than a boundary separating slash joining both. On the other hand, if it belonged to neither, it would simply be another unrelated object on its own. Only if a boundary belongs to both A and B at once can it actually satisfy the meaning of being a limit.
Likewise, a boundary requires imagination because it is not just a line segment of, say, abstract geometry, but rather a real strip of space. Similarly, accident and substance both require the more fundamental notion of relation because accidents only make sense in relation to substance and substance only in relation to accident. Likewise, the obstacle is not something which we should assume to have the characteristics of a thing in any ordinary sense. It is rather simply a limit against which the activity of the eye recoils back against itself. Likewise, only the eye is actually active. Yet Fichte's point is absolutely not that the limit is just the ordinary object which persists independently of the subject and which the subject represents faithfully within consciousness in a simple one-to-one -one correspondence that reflects all of its pre-given properties in an empirical um, act of observation. It is far closer to the truth to compare the limit to, say, a sound which a person hears while dreaming, although the sleeper's internal representations will indeed be distorted in response to encountering this obstacle, the dreams are still a creative product which only use the noise as an occasion to launch into its own subjective activity. The content of the dream, therefore, does not travel from the outside to the inside of the mind. It rather originates from within one's own subjective space. For fiction, all experience is still subjective, despite taking account of the limit which is not me. This limit is not, however, a subjective illusion, but is rather something which is indeed found to be intentionally created. Fiction proposes four naive stances which might attempt to solve this riddle. First, we have qualitative realism, or the idea that the exterior thing is equally real as the mind. The mind simply recreates the appearance of it, through a subjective representation which only ever mimics the thing in itself um, from one remove away. In the sense of qualitative idealism, we find that only the mind exists, so all experience is the product of a free subjective construction which creates images without any limit or law to restrict this activity, yet the two somehow become completely dependent on each other for just that reason. In the stance of quantitative idealism, you find a more sophisticated idealism in which a law is introduced as the mediator between the me and the not me. Whereas in quantitative realism, you find that the limit does exist, but it is not a thing. It has no qualitative features as such. Its only characteristic is the quantitative feature of being the limit against which the eye's activity impinges. All four of these ultimately will fail. Qualitative realism, for example, assumes the thing can actually enter the mind and manipulate it. But if the not-me could become the me, this would no longer give you a true subject. In the stance of qualitative idealism, the problem is that by seeming to attribute unlimited power to the subject, you still somehow fail to answer why such a seemingly omnipotent subject would make so basic an error as to be deceived by its own creation, by mistaking its own constructions for some autonomous thing in itself. This introduces limitation, you might notice, back even when defining the stance as the absence of limit itself. None of them, in other words, can resolve the classic Fichtean uh, uh, antinomy. At this point, therefore, because no further analysis is possible, yet the contradiction still remains, we have reached the end of the theoretical part of Fichte's system and must turn to the practical. The big practical question will be, can the I really determine the not-me? And this is what we will explore in the next video.